Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on higher order derivatives. Here are the two exercises that we'll be going through in this video, as well as the times at which they occur. And let's go right to that first one. All right, so we're trying to find the second derivative of the function, and the concept is pretty simple. Derive q, and then derive it again, right? So let me show you what no matter how many warnings I give, let me show you what, what probably half of my students would end up doing if this were given to them on, on the test. They would derive it, they would use the quotient rule, and there in blue we see is the, uh, here is our first derivative, and then we would take that and do the quotient rule again, and end up with this final answer. And look, that's the right answer. But can you see what we could have done that would make this make our lives a lot easier here? Let me go back to the original equation. Can you see another option? Um, you need to recognize it. No matter how many warnings I give, there are going to be those of you who, who neglect this, these words of wisdom. Let's simplify algebraically before we do any calculus. Let's consider this as two separate fractions, 3t to the fourth over 5t, and that's going to give me three-fifths t to the third, and that is the way I just wrote it here is the way that I think is most user-friendly for the purposes of deriving in the next step. And then we'll look at this fraction, minus 12 over 5t. And again, looking ahead to the next step, the fact that we're going to be deriving in the next step, let's write this in the most user-friendly way. Let's write minus 12 fifths t to the negative 1. Now when I derive it, when I do my first derivative, q prime of t, the derivative of this first piece is going to be, let's see, 9 fifths t squared, right? And then when I derive the second half, that will give me minus negative, so plus 12 fifths t to the negative 2. And let's derive it again. Already we're seeing that that was way easier than using the quotient rule. We derive it again, and we get 18 fifths t um, plus, or actually it's going to go back to being a minus now, isn't it? Minus 24 fifths t to the negative third. Uh, if I feel the need to avoid negative exponents, that would be um, 18t over 5, I'm going to write it this way for a reason, you'll see in a moment, minus 24 over 5t cubed. So I could write that um, if I want to go ahead and combine those into a single term. And again, there are reasons why we eventually will want to do that in certain scenarios. If I want to combine those into a single term, I'll multiply top and bottom by t cubed, and that will give me my common denominator. So that would give me a final second derivative of q double prime of t equals 18t to the fourth minus 24 all over 5t cubed. Piece of cake, right? Let's compare that to what the quotient rule, applying the quotient rule twice would have given us. So here we had 18t to the fourth minus 24 over 5t cubed. And that is exactly the same thing that we had way down here, but with a lot less work. So again, take my, my uh, overabundant warnings seriously. Um, watch out for a little algebraic simplification up front before you do any calculus to make your life a lot easier. Okay, we could do the usual checking methods via calculator, but I'll leave that up to you. I, I trust you're getting the hang of that by now. Let's look at the second. Um, exercise, find the higher order derivative when we are given the fact that the third derivative is equal to 5 sine of x, and we're being asked what's the eighth derivative. Uh, I'll remind you that we typically use the notation h prime for the first derivative, h double prime, h triple prime for the second and third derivative respectively, but beyond that, it gets too messy. If, you want, if I want to do the eighth derivative, I hope it's clear why that is becoming really unwieldy. So once you get beyond the third derivative, that's where we start to use the parentheses. 
Uh, and make sure you do include the parentheses, because if you just put this, this in a lot of contexts could look like h to the fourth power. It could look like h of x raised to the fourth power. But when you put it in parentheses, that clearly indicates that we're talking about the fourth derivative or the eighth derivative in this case. OK, so with that being said, uh, if we know what the third derivative is, all we have to do is derive it again to get the fourth derivative, right? So here I'll use that notation, h parentheses 4 of x. And if I derive that, I would get 5 cosine x. If I derive that, I'll get the fifth derivative. And that's going to give me 5, but it's going to be negative 5 sine x because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? Uh, h6 of x. And the nice thing about the sinusoids is that they have such a, a, a distinct pattern when you derive them that eventually the, the pattern might kind of clue you in as to where we're headed with this. But let's just, we're not too far away. Let's finish it out. This would be negative 5 cosine x. If I derive it again, the seventh derivative of h, that would be, let's see, it'd be back to positive 5 sine x. And if I do one more, that's going to bring me back to the eighth derivative of x, or that's going, um, which would be 5 cosine x. Okay, and get rid of that underline, actually. And we'll call that done. Um, you, you do notice, again, the repeating pattern here between, as we go down the list, 5 sine x, 5 cosine, negative 5 sine, negative 5 cosine, and then it repeats again. Um, and we could use that pattern to kind of back our way into, ask, into answering the question, what would h of x equal? Wouldn't be too hard to figure out. But that's, I'll save that for another day. When we do uh, uh, encounter problems where you're given a derivative or a second derivative and then you're asked what's the original function, that is a process called anti-deriving. But we'll save that for another time and just call this example or this exercise done.